The driveway is higher than the plaza and it's higher than the road and the mound actually goes two more houses down the streets. So when they measure this one back in the 60s, Mr. Bushnell, he said this was 900 feet long, 300 feet wide, 25 feet above sea level at the highest, and there used to be a wing that went that way across across what is now Park Street. Unfortunately, that part they didn't huge. Road through it. So it was really huge. And in fact, there's a similar sized mound at Crystal River, which gets a lot of attention. And their signage says that if 100 people had each carried 36 large baskets of material per day, by the math of the volume of the mound, it would take 19 years to have built the mound, 100 people carrying 36 baskets every day. So that's a lot of effort. Wow. Why did they build them? Why did they go through all that effort, the, all, that, all that moving of material? Well, I wish we had someone from the village to ask, but since we don't, since there's none of them here today, I give you a David Letterman style top four reasons to build an Indian mound in Florida, and then I tell you in my opinion which one this is. So I start off by mentioning burial mounds. A lot of folks ask me, is it a burial mound? And the short answer is no, it's not a burial mound, but I can give you a little more detail than that. First of all, not everybody ended up in a burial mound. You had to be kind of important to be buried in a burial mound. Otherwise, what might happen to you when you died is they would take your body out to one of the barrier islands or the mangrove islands and leave you there where only the birds could get you. Uh, or maybe even raised on a platform where only the birds could get you. Apparently, and I'm not quite sure why, they really didn't want big animals dragging off the bones. They didn't want raccoons or big cats to come along and, and bobcats to come along and drag away the bones. That was terrible, but they didn't seem to mind. They didn't seem to mind so bad if the birds had a chance to pick them over out on the islands. It could be due to a reverence for birds or maybe just the fact that the soft parts were kind of impermanent anyway and were gonna decompose anyway. So who cares if the birds got to them first? Um, when they buried bodies in the burial mound though, it was a little different. They would first go to a part of the village called the Charnel House. And there at the Charnel House would be a priest, like a priest of the dead who lived there. Um, there would be guards to keep the animals out of there. Uh, sometimes the duty for a young person being punished, like if you messed up, they'll make you go guard the Charnel House, keep the animals out at night. Um, and they would prepare the bodies there. Preparing the bodies meant different things to different groups of people, but for the Tokubaga, I read it often meant desiccating them or drying them out and wrapping them up in skins, which they tied together with little bits of leather or rawhide into a little bundle. Uh, there are several potential burial mounds around here, and my grandfather believed with all his heart there was one up the road here a little bit. Uh, I won't say exactly where because I don't know exactly where and I wouldn't want to spook somebody into thinking they're living on an Indian burial mound. <laughs> I'm not quite sure where it was, but Grandpa thought it was to the north of our property. He also said there were bones downtown St. Pete near 1st Street, like 14th, 15th Avenue North. There were bones when he was young. Uh, and he also said, well actually this is not what he said, in modern times the, the best burial mound I've learned about in, in the last couple of years, they found one in Safety Harbor near that Philippi Park mound, which is a mound at Philippi Park. There's a burial mound in that area as well. And that one they excavated. And they found these body bundles. And they were arranged like the spokes of a wheel going around in a circle and covered up in layers of clay. And they were kind of stacks, like multiple of these circular layers where they found wow. these little bundles of bodies latched together with a little bit of leather. Um, our archeologists spent four years here and they looked lots of places. And to my knowledge, nobody has ever found a human bone on this mound or any evidence of a burial. So I think because we haven't found anything like that, it just about rules out this being a burial mound. But we can talk more about them if you're interested. I'll just skip that over for now and say, why else build mounds? Well, that's uh, after burial mounds. The next one I usually say is pretty simple for Florida to keep your important buildings safe and dry from floods and from storm surges. The religious building or temple was built on a temple mount and important people lived on what they called platform mounds where they built a house up on a platform. The big one at Philippi Park that you can drive up to the top or you take a bike up to the top of, the one by the water, mm -hmm. they think was one for an important person. Maybe the cacique or a leader of the whole Tokubaga nation might've lived there. The one at the park wow. next door, my artist drew a house on top. Uh, they think maybe somebody lived on that little mound next door. This one, the artist drew a house on it too, but this one is a little bit different. Um, their biggest buildings were called great houses. And great houses were like meeting lodges. 
And the Spanish, when they landed, described a great house that could hold 300 people at one time. And my artist drew that one up on top of this mound. Apparently it was on a long, long mound. My best evidence for this being the great house or the meeting place is not proof of a structure, although grandfather did find evidence of a post mold when their, their buildings were built with wooden posts and thatched roofs and high ceilings to let the hot air rise and the cool air flow underneath. When those wooden posts rot in place in the ground over hundreds of years, they can leave a discoloration in the soil called a post mold. And if you can find two post molds, you can draw a line between them and get to work doing the outline of a building. My grandfather curiously found one post mold oh, up just here one? and looked around for another one and never, never found another one. So I can't really tell you the outline of a building or if there was a building here or not. Um, but my best evidence for this being a meeting place or a gathering place versus someone's private residence or, or living arrangement is the fact that here we are above the flat plaza, which I believe was a gathering place for meetings and ceremonies. And I find so much pottery all over this mound. And as I mentioned, that was sort of the stuff that they held in reserve for special occasions like the fine china. I feel like they were using a lot of it here or making it here and that there were meetings taking place here. But the last reason to build a mound, I did burial, living mound, gathering place. The last reason is the trash dump. And mm -hmm. in fact, on my map, they call this the main midden, M-I-D-D-E-N. And if you look that word up in a dictionary, midden literally means the garbage dump. That's what it means. Uh, it's probably the most common type of mound to find around here are these coastal midden mounds. Maximo Park near the Skyway has about a 10 foot high shell ridge by the 18th Frisbee Golf Hole. And that's a, a midden mound, I believe, from the fishermen. There's one at Pinellas Point, there's one at Wheaton Island. They're all over town. And there used to be a lot of them. In fact, I saw an old advertisement for St. Pete that said St. Petersburg, city of mounds by the sea. They're trying to get people to come visit the mounds. Um, unfortunately, most of those mounds are gone. And the, what happened to most of them is they were used as road fill. And I read that in those days of heavy developments when they didn't really value the Indian mounds, they could back a truck right up to the big midden mounds. The workers could stand on top of the truck and they could just shovel that stuff downhill into the, into the back of the truck and not even have to lift their shovel up into the, wow. into the back of the truck. So they just transferred these mounds and used them to lay out road beds and foundations. My grandfather though, I call him a preservationist before it was cool. Uh, nowadays, there are lots of people out there who would speak up to save an American Indian mound from destruction. But in 1940, it was like the Wild West. And if it was on your private property and you didn't want it there, it could be gone the next day and nobody said a word. But grandpa used to come out here as a kid. He used to ride that trolley out here and play with a family who lived nearby. He knew there were mounds here. And when he saw them being taken down around town, he managed to buy this one for $20,000. He never even said he owned it. He said things like, I'm the caretaker of it. I it love it. It doesn't belong to me. It belongs to the people of St. Pete and Tampa Bay, but I'm the caretaker or the steward. And he made it his business to preserve it just like it was in 1940. Uh, he loved the mound so much that when he and grandpa, uh, grandma, gra grandma and grandpa passed away, their final request was to be cremated and have their ashes spread here in the mound. So there's some stone markers down here, one for grandma, one for grandpa, with their birth and death dates. Uh, it's not that their bodies are there, but their ashes are spread all over. And the other stone closest to us we has love you, eight names on it. Uh, those are not people. Uh, it says Francis's favorite pets and Francis's grandma. There are five peacocks, two parrots, and a rabbit buried <laughs> up here on the mound. <laughs> and two of the names, Heathcliff and Gertrude, are the very first two peacocks in Parkshire history. I'll tell you more about that as we go back down. Like this. Yeah. It's a live oak tree, which I know a lot of the big ones here are, and I'm not quite sure why it's bloomed like that or how long it's been bloomed like that, but it is still alive. I can see some green from the branch tips. So That's some of you might know tree. why that tree is leaning because of possible telluric currents, the earth energy currents, and trees, when you look in nature, trees show us where the energy lines are. <laughs> Isn't that fun? Look at this is what he's talking about. It's not upright, hey? Look at it, it's growing this way. Yeah. And where it's pointing to, overall, it's gonna be almost like the central part. I haven't yet really tuned in, so I've been listening to the data. More to come. 